characters, email, no, chapter one, characters, I'm doing this really quick, because I have to go to work soon, and I don't have time to make a full video, um, I was at Free RPG Day today, and I really wanted to get the Pathfinder Weeby Goblins adventure, because I like Pathfinder, and I love their adventures, Paizo is really good at that, but instead, I picked up a little book from one of my other absolute favorite RPGs, uh, Dungeon Crawl Classics, which is a... Back when 3rd Edition came out, Goodman Games started publishing these Dungeon Crawl Classics, and they took the game back to the original D&D. Not in the rules. They still use the 3rd Edition rules, but the flavor of everything was old school. Like, not even when I grew up with RPGs old school. I mean, like, before I was born, old school. 1970s kind of old school RPGing. And when I was there today, um, the bookstore had, you know, the number of products all laid out and you could pick which one you want. It said Dungeon Crawl Classics role-playing game adventure starter. And I'm like, wait a minute. I don't know of any Dungeon Crawl Classics role-playing game. It's always used the third edition Dungeons & Dragons rules. So I took a look at it and I opened it up and it said that... Uh, Dungeon Crawl Classics role-playing game will be released in late 2011. And I said, okay, I'm going to get this book because I like the old school. If nothing else, there's this immense feeling of nostalgia, which is pretty cool. And when you look inside, I mean, the, the book is what? 15, 20 pages long, maybe? 16 pages. Um, it's just two short adventures and some really brief overview. Um, actually, not even not even an overview of the game. But it says you can download the rules online. So if you go to Goodman Games, they have their DCC RPG book, which is what this is right now, the PDF. And uh, we'll go down. You're, you're no hero. You're a reaver, a cut purse, a heathen slayer, a tight-lipped warlock guarding long-dead secrets. You seek gold and glory, winning it with sword and spell, caked in the blood and filth of the weak, the dark, the demons, and the vanquished. There are treasures to be won deep underneath, and you shall have them. And then awesome picture. Now this, I mean, this isn't like, <laughs> this guy's really cool looking. This guy is kind of creepy looking. She's, her hat's stupid. And this guy's kind of badass. He looks like a dwarf. Anyway, this is old school RPG art too. Very nice. This is the kind of stuff you'd get back in the uh, 80s, actually. Back in the 70s, it was even worse. It was really amateurish, uh, the original D&D stuff. But here's the cool thing. They do go right back. Uh, everything kind of follows D20 rules and D20 conventions, but there's differences. So the number one difference is you're going to have uh, the character creation funnel. Back in the day... In a original D&D, &D, you rolled 3d6 for each of your ability scores straight down. Whatever you got is what you got. Deal with it. And this game goes right back to that. They uh, prevent people from min-maxing and power gaming by making you randomly create characters and then running them through a gauntlet and seeing which one comes out the other side. If something survives to the end, congratulations. Now you have a character that you know can survive. And that'll be your dude. So... And see, they do this, uh, they enforce balance by randomization rather than complexity. Normal D&D &D nowadays, 3rd edition, 4th edition, everything is supposed to be carefully balanced as an option so that you go, th you choose this or you choose that, they're pretty much going to be equal. In reality, it doesn't always work out that way, and that's how you end up with min-maxing and power gaming. People can find which combinations of abilities are better than others when they release a feat that maybe is exactly the same as a previous feat, but better because it doesn't have a certain limitation, or maybe it gives you an extra bonus, things like that. This doesn't do that. And in fact, this game forces you to start off as a level zero character, a character without any class abilities, a character that is pretty much nothing. And uh, you have to run through a difficult, deadly dungeon. In fact, the sample dungeon they give me in the free RPG day handout, um, let's see. This adventure is designed for 15 to 20 zero level characters. Yeah, you run a whole crap ton of characters through this gauntlet and hope one comes out. This even actually tells you um, that you're going to make up... I'm not sure where it says that. Somewhere in here it says that you're going to make two or three... Oh, uh, da, 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 da. Yeah, 
First, each player generates at least two, possibly as many as four zero-level characters. I don't know, um, because I haven't read this entire document. It's 170 pages about. I don't know if each of those players runs like all three of their or you know characters at once through the dungeon. So you have like five players, which is about the normal gaming group, four to six. And each of those five players has three characters. And so there's 15 characters running around in this game. And by the end of it, you see who survives. I mean, that's possible. And that's what I'm expecting. I don't expect you to have to have 15 to 20 players sitting down going through that adventure. So I think at first you run multiple characters. All right. So yeah, high mortality, player choices, which with randomly generated characters takes risks, which stays safe. So when you roll up characters with random ability scores, you're going to end up with some with good ability scores and some with absolutely terrible ability scores. Now, if you're playing this game and you've got three characters, you put that guy with the terrible ability scores in the front. You let him take the brunt. He opens doors. He tries to open chests. He's the guy who's going to get killed by all the traps. Because you're protecting your guy with the better ability scores. You're hoping that that guy is the one who survives to the end. Because then you get to pick a class. And then you get you know a stronger character that way. But I mean it's entirely possible for you. Since you're randomly rolling ability scores. To have three really good or three totally crappy characters. However, if one of them manages to survive to the end of the adventure and gets class levels, maybe, you know, he'll go about it. And one of the things they say here is, there are essentially no opportunities for min-max play, and yet players find themselves attached to their plucky little serfs who have done such amazing deeds at low levels. When you take these randomly generated characters and they manage to live through this adventure, you have the stories of that adventure behind you, and you do grow an attachment to a character that way. Um, it's a different type of... a attachment than the people who sit down to make up a character and they write out pages of backstory and all kinds of stuff that's another way to do it too i uh my characters personally i find a lot more uh this way i sit down with an idea of a character but i let how the play turns out actually define them so i kind of like this idea the problem is and i'll see it when i get to it um, you got ability scores. There's six ability scores. Instead of going with the normal D&D &D ones, though, they call them strength, agility, stamina, personality, intelligence, and luck. Strength, dexterity, constitution, personality is a combination of wisdom and charisma, intelligence, and then luck is a, a, an extra one on top of that. You randomly roll all of these using 3d6 straight down. And it even says, don't roll more dice and drop the lowest. Don't use point by. Don't assign ability scores in the order that you want. Roll them randomly. Stick them down. This can grade on people. But this is a good system for a game that you just kind of want to sit down and pick up and play. You don't want to put too much time and thought into making the character. And uh, if the system uh, with all of these adventures that they're planning to write works that way... It, it can work out well. I can see myself playing this game because there's not a lot of upfront investment in the character. And then once you start playing, that's when the investment comes and then you become engaged with the system. Yeah, sure, maybe you wish your strength score was a little bit higher, but in old school games, there's all kinds of weird random effects and special bonuses that because the game's not meant to be balanced from the beginning, it's perfectly fine for the dungeon master, or in this game they call them the judge, to throw in there. So, you know, maybe my character drinks from a magic pool and suddenly he gains two points of strength. In 3rd edition D&D, there's a certain gold piece amount attached to the idea of plus two strength. You get gauntlets of ogre power, and now you have plus two to your strength score, and it takes up your gauntlet slot. That's all for balance purposes, to prevent you from layering on all these different strength effects. This game doesn't have that. This game lets you just get strong if they want to. I mean, you can do that in regular third edition too, but the fact that there's rules for it kind of puts people in the mindset that they need to conform to those rules. All right, so anyway, we got these. Uh, you don't have to read. I mean, download this if you want to read it. Luck is kind of cool. There's a lot of stuff that goes with luck. Um, you have a luck score and your luck modifier, you have ability score modifiers. They're similar to, but not equal to the ones you normally get in third edition. And your luck score modifier applies to certain abilities. You actually have to roll on a random table. That's another old school thing is randomly rolling everything. And on that other table, it tells you what your luck modifier applies to. And then if you survive and gain a class, classes let you apply your luck modifier to certain other things as well. 
Um, and you see here, like, it determines how many spells you can know, just like in D&D, &D, and the max spell level you can cast, just like in D&D. &D. Slightly different than D&D, &D, but the same general concept. Here we have the Guidance Counselor. With innate intelligence, you won't go far as a wizard, so you'll be at minus one modifier. You will know the same number of spells, but you have a max spell level of two. Um, but as a warrior, you can still earn fame and a fine salary of 46 GP. That's awesome. I love the way how he looks like a total... He looks like Barney Rubble almost, and then yet she's all dressed up nice. Like an, I almost want to say modern, but that's kind of Victorian era. Anyway, go down here to our luck score. You can see that there's just attack rolls, melee attack rolls, missile rolls, missile fire damage rolls, and cute little uh, flavorful names. In first edition D&D, &D, each class level for each class had a name to describe it. So that you could say what you know, you that you were a cavalier, and maybe that meant you were a fighter level seven or something like that. Similarly, this game has names for all the different class levels too. But you can see here they've got just these little things. So you can tell people, you know, I've got the I was born under the sign of Hawkeye, and that means that you get, you know, people know that you're better at melee da uh, at missile fire damage rolls. You can have negative luck too, and then it kind of sucks to be you. You can see here, based on what your luck is, it kind of determines later on when you gain a class what you want to do. For example, if you have a, a high luck and you happen to have a bonus to uh, find and disable traps, you're probably going to want to be a thief. Why? Because thieves are the kind of the only ones who can do find and disable traps. Otherwise, your luck bonus would be kind of useless based on this. All right, so then we'll forget about that for now. I started rolling an ability score. Um, let's go here. I'm watching Big Mac's uh, Quest 64 Let's Play. But here we are, and you can just barely see it. This is the Dungeons & Dragons Dice Roller on Wizards.com. Uh, when you type in Die Roller into Google, this is one of the first things that comes up. And this is I don't have my dice right next to me. Normally I do, but they're in my car. So I rolled 11, 12, and 16 were my first three rolls with 3d6. So you can see here... I have a strength of 11, agility of 12, stamina of 16. So now I need to roll three more times. 1, 2, 3, 14, 9, 7. So 14, 9, and 7. I am not lucky. In fact, I have a luck penalty. I have a minus one penalty to my luck. So whatever my luck roll is, that's going to be bad. Uh, everything else, my 9 is fine. 11 and 12 are fine. 14 and 16, however, are bonuses. I am plus one and plus two. Nothing runs off of stamina. There's no like stamina based class. So it just means I'm more, I'm hardier. And a 14 personality, personality is the casting stat for clerics. So most likely, if this guy survives uh, of a zero level adventure, he would become a cleric because that would make the best use of his bonus to personality. All right, so now let's go down here and roll our luck score. And this is 1d30. That's something else I probably should have mentioned at the beginning. This game, I don't understand why they do it. Like, there's no... I don't see the mathematical purpose behind it. Like, Or not purpose, necessity. There's no reason that they need to have d3, 5, 7, uh, 14, 16, 24, and 30. But they do. Part of the reason... Now, mathematical necessity. There's certain ranges of probability you get by using those dice instead of the normal dice although you can use the normal dice to simulate them um, but what it is I believe is they want to use those special dice because then they get to sell those special dice it's an incentive for people to buy weird dice just like the original D&D &D using D4, D8, D12 whatever was an incentive to buy weird dice they could have made the game using just D6's um, but they didn't Okay, so here's a d30 roll. Can you do a d30? Yes, you can. 1d30. Roll. Total, 30. Oh, I put 30d1. I got what you're doing. Okay. So, do it that way. Roll. Okay, 27. 27 means I was born under the unholy house, which is corruption rolls. Which is useless, because corruption is something that, if I remember correctly, I didn't read the whole thing, but I, I flipped through. I think corruption only applies to wizards. But, uh, unholy house, birth auger. That's not how you spell auger, and this is corruption rolls. Okay. 
And was there anything else that I needed to roll? Ah, yes. So each character at zero level has an occupation. So we start off with 1d4 hit points modified by stamina. 1d4, 1. Wow, that sucks. Luckily, my stamina is plus 2. So I have HP 3. You probably can't see that very well. There we go. Then 5d12 copper pieces. So find my d12, put in a 5, roll, and I got 34 copper. 34 copper pieces. Next, I'm at negative 100 XP. You do not gain a class level until you hit positive experience points. So they start you at negative 100. And then as you adventure, you gain experience and then gain a class level. They also recommend for players, uh, for the judges, after a zero level character survives one adventure, go ahead and give them one experience. Uh, put them at one experience so that they can choose a class level. Because it's not necessarily the most fun thing in the world to play these really weak characters through multiple adventures. Surviving one, yes. There's an element of danger and suspense. But once you do that, then you want to actually be able to do something. All right, one randomly determined piece of equipment. See table three, four. That's my occupation. Table three, four. That must be in the equipment chapter. All right, let's try this. Table three, four. There we go. All right, I'm going to roll 1d24. See, why does it have to be 1d24? There's no reason. 24, roll. I have 14. Oop, wrong button. Which means I have a lantern worth 10 gold pieces. So let's just put that down here. Lantern. That's not how you spell lantern. Oh, my gosh. Look at that. I am Dracula. Ah, ah, ah. And now I need to go back to whatever page I was at. Oh, I can just do that search again. There we go. One randomly determined occupation. Okay, I can do that. And uh, occupation is here. So here's our occupation. It's going to be 1D100 to determine what our occupation is. So here, 100, roll. Occupation 54. I am a guild beggar. I belong to the Beggar's Guild. I have a sling and crutches. So I am, I should put that here. Occupation, whoop. Guild beggar. I have a sling and I have crutches. What do crutches do? Whatever you need them to do, they're crutches. That's what they. That's how they work. And at the bottom here, it says, if a missile fire weapon such as a sling or dart, roll 1d6 to determine the number of sling stones or darts. So roll. I have six sling stones. So times six stones. All right. There's a bunch of stuff on here. You can see that there's different types of farmers and stuff. You can actually get like a dog or a begging bowl. Why didn't I get a begging bowl? I'm a member of the Bloody Beggars Guild. Oh, well. What else is there to do? Anything else? Okay, weapon training. You're automatically uh, proficient with the weapon that you get from your occupation. So I automatically know how to use the sling. And here it's just telling you, try and uh, barter your way. Most players, they might not have even ever seen coins. Because back in the day, all trade was conducted via barter. I will give you this for that. You know, there's no monetary intermediate Dun, 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 dun. That guy's awesome. Oh, this is the picture that I wanted to complain about. This is funny and hilarious, and I love it, but it's the exact wrong picture to put in a game like this. You don't want players to think of, you know, it's like, oh, let's do a role-playing game. You know, we'll play Dungeon Crawl Classics, and, uh, you know, your character can turn into a mighty warrior or a thief or a wizard or a cleric. And it's like, okay, well, let's get started. I'm like, all right, well, this is kind of how it plays at first. And you're like, really? I'm going to beat people up with a rolling pin and some candles? It doesn't inspire heroic fantasy kind of ideas. It's hilarious, but I don't think it's a very good picture to have right here. Um, because I think if you look at this, it's as soon as I saw this that I was slightly put off the game. I didn't like it very much. It's an ex and it sucks because it's a very well drawn picture too. I especially love this guy back here with the hammer. He's cool. Is that it? Oh, I get to pick an alignment. My character will be lawful. Why not? Dun dun dun. dun. Lots of good art in here too. Yeah, and it's only when you reach you know one experience that you get to choose a class. And these are the classes. 
Uh, these four classes are available to anybody, Thief, Warrior, Cleric, and Wizard. On the occupation table, if you rolled Halfling, Dwarf, or Elf, then you can be a Halfling, Dwarf, or Elf. A Halfling is like a slightly different Thief, a Dwarf is a slightly different Warrior, and an Elf is a slightly different Wizard. And uh, in some ways they're a little bit better, but in some ways they're not. So they're slightly, you know, balanced that way. For example, uh, warriors end up with the best die for attacks, and they get the best critical hit table. Dwarves lose a little bit of that, but they get an, a shield bash attack automatically, which is kind of cool. Anyway, that's this. I might not even post this, but maybe I will. Bye-bye.